now I'm faced with a question. How do you follow that? <laughs> well, we are, we are relying on and reading God's holy scripture this morning. Um, shall we pray that God would speak to us and the Holy Spirit would teach us and lead us as we open up God's word? Would you bow with me? Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we ask as we open up your holy word that you would be well pleased to, to take your living and active word and speak life into us. As we look at your amazing grace, we read Paul's words that you inspired him to write. We just pray that we would be captivated by grace, that you would refresh our thinking, that if there's any any part of us, anything in our, in our minds that regards grace as common or, or mundane or boring or typical or ordinary or something that we know or are used to or are accustomed to, I just pray that you would capture us anew and we would look upon your grace with the same astonishment as when we first laid eyes on it. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I invite you to uh, open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. You're reading a, a section here. It'll be the, the main focus of our, of our study this morning. Of course, this week is the fourth week of the Advent series that, that we've been looking at, at different characteristics, different different aspects of God, the different uh, things that we've been highlighting. Just in review, it's also in your notes there, uh, three weeks ago on the first week of Advent, as was noted during the candle lighting, we looked at God's authentic love. And we see that, that everything God's done through our redemption, through his plan, through the giving of his son, was motivated by this love, this love that we didn't earn, this love that we cannot lose, this love that's so ingrained in who God is, he expresses it to us, God's authentic love. And two weeks ago on the second week of Advent, we looked at God's justice. And oftentimes we might, we might look at God's justice as maybe in, in struggle or, or contradiction even to God's love. But as we, as we saw two weeks ago as we looked at Scripture we see that God's justice isn't contrary to his love at all, but it, God is, is just as much as he is love. And it's in God's demand for justice, it's in his requirement for justice that he maintains and demonstrates his justice by sending his son. Because if justice was not important to God, then perhaps he would just say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm being too, too serious about this sin thing. I'm being too serious about this uh, this holiness thing, I'll just say it's no big deal. But then for God to do that would be to compromise, well, that which he is. And he is holy, and he maintains that and demonstrates his justice by sending his son. Last week, Pastor Calvin highlighted God's infinite mercy, that God is rich in mercy. He blesses us through mercy. And one of the things God does in his infinite mercy is he withholds that which we deserve. That is to say, we deserve punishment. We deserve that which, which Jesus bore for us. But God in his mercy, he withheld what we deserve. And this morning on this, this final week of Advent in preparation and getting our minds leading up to Christmas, we are looking at God's amazing grace. If mercy is a withholding of that which we deserve, grace is a giving of that which we don't. Let's look here at Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Would you stand with me as God's holy scripture is read? Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1, says this. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived 
among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of God's great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace that you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. May be seated. One of the first things we're going to look at this morning that's, that's just mentioned all throughout this passage we want to highlight is that God's grace is undeserved. God's grace is undeserved. We realize that God's gift of his grace, and we're going to talk about what grace does for us, but before we get there, we just want to mention, we want to focus in on this idea that, that God's grace is not earned. There's nothing we did that God looked upon that said, wow, I, you know, they're being especially good right now. I, I ought to show them some grace. They're trying really hard. I think, hmm, yeah, I, I, think, I think grace is appropriate here. God's grace comes in the midst of our failure. God's grace comes in the midst of our, of our need. And God's grace comes when we don't deserve it. We never deserve it. But that's what, that's what makes his grace so remarkable. I was talking to an individual uh, just uh, a week and a half ago or so. And he was talking about forgiveness. He knows that over the last several years he had led a, a certain life that he felt really guilty for and he felt really shameful about. And he says, I know I've asked God for forgiveness. And I think he's forgiven me, but sometimes I wonder if, I wonder if I really deserve forgiveness. And I wonder if I'm really forgiven. He says, do you wonder that? And I looked at him. He's just sitting there having coffee. And he said, you don't. If there's any wondering, let me, put that at, let, let, let me put that to rest. If you're wondering if you deserve forgiveness, you don't. And that's the point of grace. We didn't earn God's forgiveness. We didn't, we didn't do something that, that was noteworthy. In fact, we didn't even approach him. We didn't initiate. We didn't approach God and say, God, we're so sorry. Would you send us a savior? What does the Bible say? That God demonstrates his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God saw that we had this, this need, this need that we couldn't fulfill in of ourselves. We weren't even coming to him. We weren't capable of coming to him because we don't have just a sin problem. What does this passage say? This passage says we are dead in our sins. We are dead in our transgressions. We are separated from God who is the one who gives us life. And when we're separated from God who gives us life, we're dead. We need to understand that. We need to understand the, the, the condition we were in. We weren't just hurt. We weren't just dying. We're dead. If you look at this passage, we are dead in our transgressions. We are spiritually dead. And death is a... Death is a concept, well, for many of us, we, we understand a little bit. We understand how, how final it is. We understand how little can be done. What would you do? You know, we talk, about, we talk about leading someone to the Lord. We talk about sharing the gospel with them. And we have to realize that even as we think of Christmas Eve upcoming, and inviting people to come to church to hear the gospel, it's not about us. It's not about what we do. Because there's nothing that you and I can do to raise the dead. Let's go to the local cemetery. 
and try to raise the dead this afternoon. It's not going to happen without God's intervention. This is what he does. This is by his grace. He looked at us as we were dead in our sins, as we were dead in our transgressions because we've separated ourselves from him. And in our helplessness, this is what that means, that, that it's undeserved. We didn't, we didn't earn it. There's nothing we could do to earn it. In our absolute helplessness, God gives grace. By the way, God's grace also wasn't paying it forward. It wasn't just God was putting a new debt on us because we're already indebted. It wasn't just, okay, I'll, I'll do you one more, one more gift, but now you got to live the, the rest of your life paying it back. We can't pay back grace either. We didn't earn it, and there's, there's no expectation to then, to then pay him back. We'll get to that in a minute. What does grace do for us? It does three things, at least here, and we see them in the text. First thing, and this is in your notes, that God's grace makes us alive with Christ. We're also looking here at the, uh, the book of Colossians. I love how in Colossians uh, chapter 2, verse 13, Paul just simply says this, when you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. And we realize that, that this gift of God, this grace gift, makes us alive with Christ. It makes us alive. It does, it does, first of all, the very thing that we can't do ourselves. In our death, we can't bring about our own resurrection. In our death, we can't, we can't jumpstart our hearts. We can't cause our lungs to, to fill with breath again. And spiritually speaking here, in, in our death, in our spiritual death, God's gift of grace through Jesus makes us alive. Changes the game entirely. It's the biggest change, right? It's this, it's this first change that needs to take place because while we're dead, Christ makes us alive. And now all the rest of these things that we're going to look at is possible. What's this next thing? Colossians uh, 3 verses 1 and 2 is our reference here. God's grace raises us up in Christ. Look at Colossians 3. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Paul says, set your hearts on things above. Where Christ is sealed at the right hand of God, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. If to, we have to realize that as, as God's given us life, as he's, as he's resurrected us, he hasn't just left us living in the grave. Metaphorically speaking, as, as, as God's made us alive, he's also raised us up. Raised us up to a life with Christ. And now this, this entirely new life, this life that wasn't possible before, is possible. And Paul here gives us this encouragement, by the way, that as we've been raised with Christ, now our thinking can change, now our behaviors can change, now our actions can change. There's a whole wealth of of possibilities here. We don't have to go on gratifying the, the desires of our sinful nature. We don't have to go on living in the bondage of, of sin and destruction. We don't have to go on living with that punishment and that guilt and that shame and that burden because we have been raised with Christ by God's grace. You are made alive with Christ. You are raised up with Christ the third thing here. God's grace seats us in the heavenly realm. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 here. Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 21, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. God changes our very citizenship. We've been made alive with Christ. He raised us up and he seats us in heaven, this heavenly realm. You have a place waiting for you by God's grace. You have a new citizenship by God's grace. 
just as Jesus, Jesus died for our sins and the power of God raised him to life, gave him life, raised him from the grave. And we read through scripture that Christ has been exalted and he's placed in the heavenly realm. He's seated at the right hand of God. God's grace makes us alive, raises us up, and gives us a place with him forever in heaven. This is what God's grace does. Lest we've forgotten how amazing it is. Lest we've forgotten how much it's changed us. Lest we've forgotten how much, how, how important it is. God's grace isn't something that's just common or cavalier. or It's a nice bonus to have in life. No, it is life. We need God's grace. Well, if we don't deserve it, how does it happen? We talked about what God did, what Jesus did, what Jesus finished. That God identifying our need. God looking at a group of, of spiritually dead people that he loves so dearly because of his great love. In his justice and his mercy, he sent his son, the Lord Jesus. Sent him to live this sinless life, which is important, by the way. Jesus had to intentionally live this sinless life so that he would be the appropriate sacrifice. It isn't just uh, one person dying for another, so to speak, because it takes someone without guilt of their own to take on the guilt of someone else. So Jesus had to live a guiltless life to take on our guilt to take on what we deserve. And he did. We talked a couple of weeks ago that Jesus took the wrath of God against sin upon himself. And it wasn't just hard. It wasn't just hurtful. It wasn't just damaging. Jesus died. He died our death in our place. But he didn't stay there. He didn't stay dead. He took him from the cross. They put him in a tomb like they do with people who've died. He was buried. But praise God that the story doesn't end there either. You see, we, we look at Christ's work of atonement, we look at Christ's work of salvation as Jesus died for me. Yes, Jesus died for you and me. But see, he was resurrected. He was, he was raised to new life. This isn't a, a metaphorical life, by the way. It isn't as though Jesus' body is still physically in the grave, but, but we just imagine that spiritually he was resurrected. No, God filled his lungs with air. His heart began to beat, and he walked from that empty tomb. And he raised to literal new life. And that's important because by God's grace... He demonstrates his power over death and he gives us that same gift that we walk from the graves of the death that we died. As Christ was resurrected, God gives us life. You and I need grace tremendously. The world outside these doors needs grace tremendously. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We don't pay God back. There's nothing we can do to initiate it. So what, what does God require? How do we tap into God's grace? Paul says it here. It's by grace you've been saved. And God raised Christ up, seats us with him in the heavenly realms in order that in the coming ages he might show incomparable riches of his grace expressed in the kindness, in his kindness to us. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. Not by works. No one can boast. There's none among us here. None among us here that can say we earned this. And among us here who can say, I did a real good job and, and I, I earned my place in heaven. I caused my heart to beat again. I know I was dead, but I stopped being dead and I got up. None among us. There's no boasting. There's no boasting in and of ourselves, but you know what? There's boasting in Christ. 
There's boasting in what he's done, in what he's accomplished. And by faith, when we tap into God's grace, that's what makes this happen. Not that we cause it, not that we deserve it, not that we earn it, but it's the gift of God. And God says it's yours by faith. If you believe in him, if you realize by faith your desperate need for him, that you realize by faith what Jesus has done, what he's accomplished. By faith, you receive Jesus as your savior. This is grace. I hope this morning, as, as we look at this passage, that the, the, a couple of things happen. One, for those of us that by faith, have received God's grace, have participated in his grace, have been flooded by his grace, that we would just fill this morning with appreciation and gratitude and that freshness. Maybe in that, by the way, if you're like me, there's some repentance that needs to happen there. Repentance of Dear God, forgive me for regarding your grace as common. Forgive me for treating this as, as, as cavalier, of not being more grateful consistently. I pray this morning that, that we make that change. And we walk out from here as grateful people who were just given a free gift. No strings attached. We receive it by faith. So for those of us that have, that have participated in this, or for those of us who have received, uh, my, one of my hopes is that, is that as we've looked at this, you just fill with joy, you just fill with gratitude, you just fill with excitement, as you're reminded of this great and wonderful gift that you received however long ago, be it a year, 10 years, or longer, you just remember that day that you got that great gift. Maybe others of us, much like this person I had spoke with a week and a half ago, are still trying to earn it, are still stuck in shame and guilt and, and thoughts of unforgiveness and trying to work harder and, and earn salvation or trying to do the right thing and, and just in that mess that's exhausting, that's tiring, that's burdensome and God by his grace wants to free you from I pray this morning that, that as you've heard about God's grace, you would just by faith receive. You would understand that there's nothing you're going to do to deserve this. It's just because God loves you. He gives this grace gift to you. And the third thing that I hope to happen is this. As grateful people, as joyous people, as excited people, and also as people who may have just received that gift here today by, by, by hearing to the Holy Spirit speak to you, that we would go out into this world seeing other people who need God's grace, seeing others who are dead and hopeless, and give them the only answer. Lead them to the resurrection of Jesus. It's been mentioned already that uh, this Saturday for the Christmas Eve service, there's going to be a clear presentation, invitation of the gospel. There are door hangers out there. Uh, there's even, a, if, this is, if this is your means, there's even a, a Facebook page group um, that you can go and just invite someone that way. We would just encourage you. Invite someone to come hear the good news of Jesus. It's not going to be because of what we do. It's only because of what God does. And, you know, if, if that's intimidating by any, in any way, by the way, you know, Christmas Eve is a wonderfully freeing time to invite someone to church. If there's, if there's ever a time where you're hesitant, you say, oh, it's, it's, it's tough to, to get someone, to approach someone and say, hey, would you come to church with me? You know, Christmas and Christmas Eve is kind of a time that mm, people expect some invitations. People are more willing to come to church. So you're more likely to get someone to say, okay, thank you for the invitation. I'll come to church with you. We'd ask you to use Christmas Eve and even Christmas Day
to invite someone to church, a friend, a family member, someone you don't know. Invite them to hear the good news of Jesus. We're praying for the lost to come to faith. We're praying that those door hangers go out as invitations. We're praying for these Gospels of John to breathe life into people. We realize, by the way, it's not just if we can present the gospel in a really eloquent or convincing manner. You know what? The gospel doesn't need our eloquence. There are people who get saved just by finding God's living, active word sitting on a bench, and they read it, and they give their lives to Christ. We are just prayerfully asking God to use us to draw people to himself. Can we do that? I want to pray for these things that we be filled with joy and excitement and appreciation for grace, that we would ensure that we have received this grace by faith and that we would be compelled to go out and share this grace gift with others. Let's pray together. God, we think of your amazing grace this morning, the grace that makes us alive, the grace that raises us up, and the grace that places us in your presence in heaven. God, we thank you for this undeserved gift that you don't expect us to pay back, that we access by faith. We thank you that in your perfect love, you chose to rescue us according to your justice, withholding by, by your infinite mercy that which we deserve and bestowing by your grace that which we don't. We thank you in the precious name of our Savior and Lord, your Son, Jesus Christ.